Hello and welcome to the Modern Adventurer podcast coming up. As a woman, um, I don't want to like go on about gender differences, but actually the one thing I can, my superpower is that I can talk to women in traditional communities, which men can't. And I'm sure you found this in your travels. You know, I literally get separated from the men and that's actually a privilege because it means I get both sides of the story and I get to hear what what, what's troubling the, what the women are thinking about during Corona as well as the men. The men are thinking about how are they going to feed the family? Can they get any money for their sheep? Because the bottom completely dropped out of the meat market. Um, how are they going to, you know, if they don't have enough grazing, how are they going to afford a bag of oats? The women are not talking about that. The women are talking about their children, their health. The women are talking about they're worried about their daughters not going to school because it's such a, a it's relatively relatively new that um, universal education and women want their daughters to be educated. So a lot of the things I heard were, you know, we're really worried. Our, our children are missing out. Our, our girls are missing out on their education. We want them to have a different life from us. My next guest is an author and adventurer. Growing up in Uganda and Ghana from a young age, she had a wild childhood and has used that to pursue adventures around the world. After getting a degree in Arabic and Turkish, she used that as a platform for journalism and worked all over the world. But then in 2001, she packed it all in and went on some crazy expeditions. Today on the podcast, we go into detail about her stories from that trip as well as the nomadic community out in Morocco where she lives in the Atlas Mountains. So I am delighted to introduce Alice Morrison to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. Well, I mean, you have quite the uh, collection of trips over the last few years. And I think for people listening, probably the best place to start is at the beginning because you have such an amazing sort of childhood growing up in such sort of exotic places. And I would love to sort of hear about how you sort of got started in this sort of world of adventure. Well, I like to say that I started very early because when I was six weeks old, my parents, um, who were Scots, my mum had never left Edinburgh before, well, sorry, Scotland before, and uh, they got on a boat, sailed to Africa, got a train up to Uganda, sailed to Mombasa in Kenya, got a train up to Uganda, and went to live in the African bush in the countryside and were teachers. So my I started off, if you like, with a bit of a life of adventuring, thanks to my parents. Wow. And what part of the world in Uganda were you? We were in Fort Portal. So we were in a place called Kichwamba. Fort Portal was the nearest town. And we were in a teacher training college, uh, looking out over the Ruanzori Mountains, the Mountains of the Moon. And... I mean, it was a fantastic childhood. There is no doubt about it. Complete freedom. I didn't go to school till I was seven. Uh, my mum taught me to read when I was three. And I think all of those very early things, you don't think they shape you. You really don't. They really shape you. And I found that as I've gone through life, I've definitely moved full circle back to the kind of things that those earliest memories are. So, for example, now I live in the Atlas Mountains and our view is not dissimilar to the view I had growing up I've got mountain peaks clean air cold nights and freedom and I think for me I had a very free childhood running around there was no even though there probably were dangers there was no feeling of danger or worry from my parents you know we literally would go off and walk around in in the rainforest up the mountains things would happen to us I remember at one point I got stung by a a swarm of wild hornets and my head swelled up but we were fine and and that 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 no problem kind of attitude I think that my parents really encapsulated has definitely stood me in good stead for later life and that's where it all started yeah I always think you never you can never connect the dots looking forward you can only connect them looking back and it's so true you sort of always come back to the sort of full circle in the end with it. I, I really do think that. And I've, I think as well, anyone who's been to Africa, who's not from Africa, if you're from Africa, obviously you feel this anyway. Um, 
you, there is something about the continent. And now I'm living in North Africa, but it's something about the red earth and the smell of wild basil and wild thyme and the blue, blue sky. And on the adventure I've just finished, I spent a lot of time in the Sahara and Sahara Desert region. And, you know, those amarad trees, the thorn, thorn trees, the flat top trees against the completely empty landscape with the setting sun. And those things, they, they feel like cliches in a way, but they're not. They completely get into your blood and, and it makes me feel so happy and comfortable and somehow at one with the world I live in when I see and experience and smell and hear those sounds. Uh, and so what, you lived in Uganda for your entire childhood? Uh, no, I lived up there till I was eight. And then we came back to Scotland and <clears throat> my parents um, wanted us to go to school in Scotland to get an education. So we came back to <laughs> Scotland and... <laughs> Mom and dad didn't have any cash whatsoever. They were teachers. And so my dad went to teach at the local high school in the Highlands in Oban. And we lived in a tent because we didn't have a house. So my brother had been born by then. He was four. So we lived in this tent for a while and then it blew down in a gale and we upgraded to a caravan. So again, I think there was quite a lot of fun growing up. And then we were back in Scotland for a while. Then we went back to Africa, to West Africa, to Ghana. And then the terrible thing happened and I was sent to boarding school at the age of 11. That was a very nasty shock. Suddenly, we weren't allowed to do anything. From having been able to do everything, I was at boarding school in Edinburgh where you weren't even allowed out of the boarding school except for once a week for three hours on a Saturday morning to the sweet shop. And you had to wear two pairs of pants. Although that was quite good because it was very, very, very cold. So two pairs of pants at least kept my bottom warm. But it was all very counterintuitive to me and a bit strange and what's the reasoning behind two pairs of pants i don't even want to speculate uh we also had to wear <laughs> beige ankle socks and a green velour hat as well as normal clothes on top of course we didn't just go out in that but it was all very it was you know it was st dennis and cranley ladies academy for young ladies in edinburgh um <laughs> so it was a very different atmosphere um, from what I'd be used to. But I got my education. I left when I, as soon as I could when I was 17 and went to the Middle East. So, you know, everything serves a purpose. Everything works out for the best. <laughs> Sometimes. And so you were in the Middle East and um, I think I'm right in saying that you got your sort of degree in journalism and you studied Arabic and Turkish was it? Yeah, I did. In fact, I, this is terrible because I was a journalist and still am a journalist, um, but I did never do a degree in journalism. I studied Arabic and Turkish with politics, Islam, literature, everything Middle Eastern, if you like. And I did that at Edinburgh for four years. But before I went, and again, this is all these steps on the path, what you said about joining the circle, I got a job at a magazine in Dubai called What's On in Dubai, um, which is still going. And that that year of experience, which was amazing because I joined at the second issue. So I, I got to do absolutely everything. I was only 17 and I was writing articles about the rugby club. I know nothing about rugby and going to Bali. I'd never been to Bali. Um, set me on the path of journalism. I've become much more truthful in my old age. So I think everything kind of wove into a pattern and the Arabic and the journalism have really, I, I would say, shaped shaped my life. God, and yeah, it's and it sort of must have given you such a great springboard to sort of travel with that and see some of the most incredible parts of the world, really. Yeah, I think every, I think people have actually got a natural bent. Obviously, most people love their own country, and then some people are very attracted to different cultures. So, for example, for some people, definitely it's India, or for other people, it's Europe. You know. Venice and Vienna and Rome. And for me, it's always been Africa and the Middle East, although I, I really like South America as well. But it's that kind of, for whatever reason, I don't know if it's, again, that early imprinting, which must be a factor. Um, they've just always attracted me. I felt very comfortable. I felt that I can, I ha not have an insight into the people there, but I, I feel I can really live with people and I'm, understand where they're coming from and they understand where I'm coming from and so I feel comfortable which I think most people need to feel comfortable with the people they're living with otherwise if you just feel like a complete stranger of course I'm a stranger here but if you if you if you feel very strange 
I think it's difficult to live in different countries. Yeah. And I suppose, um, yeah, by sort of moving around when you were younger to different countries gave you that sort of comfort in being in by living in foreign countries whereas someone who's probably based themselves in one country their whole life going and living abroad is very alien to them it is and i i think something which i've come to realize and which i think is a little bit <laughs> odd about me actually but it is the truth so you know have to speak your truths um is that i actually quite like being the, the strange one, the stranger, the foreigner, the immigrant, the expatriate, doesn't matter what you call it, having a level of observation from where I am, because I, I'm not from there. So I'm slightly observing what's going on. And as I like to think of myself as a kind of a storyteller or a minstrel, because I tell a lot of stories. And I think that's one of the things that appeals to me about living in different places is, is that I'm constantly seeking out and searching for and listening really hard and learning. And I find that that really stimulates me and inspires my life. It also tires me out. I need some down and quite a lot of downtime with Netflix. <laughs> I think sometimes we all need that. So what was the turning point in your life where you suddenly decided to pursue these more, let's say, extreme adventures? I think that's a really good question. And I think most people think there is a big turning point. And I would say that mine's almost been a progression. And I don't know if that's I'm sometimes in denial about what I'm doing, uh, which is a possibility to make it less frightening. But I think there was a very big trigger point, And that was, I was um, chief executive of a media development company called Vision and Media in the northwest of England. I built it up from scratch for nine years. I had 40 staff. We'd had a budget. I built up a budget of 10 million pounds a year. We were very successful. And then absolutely no personal cause, but the Tories came into power. We were a quango. And David Cameron said, I'm going to abolish all quangos. Um, and so he abolished our two main funders within a week of each other, the people that we won money from to then invest in the economy and into film companies, TV companies, games companies. So the, the long and short of it was I had to meld my company into a bigger company, uh, make the staff or some of the staff were made redundant. I was made, I, I was redundant. And th those, those events in someone's life were quite shocking. Even if, you know, when you're in charge, I was going to be without a job, but also I was making other people lose their jobs. And that responsibility did certainly weighed very heavily. And I'd seen this race years before to race across Africa. And I'd always wanted to go back to my African roots to, you know, feel those things that I felt as a child again and wonder if I could remember more from my childhood. So I signed up for a race. I signed up to race across the continent from Cairo to Cape Town, which is um, eight, 8,000 miles, 12,500 K on my bike, uh, without any, unlike you, I'm very bad at training. So my training consisted of watching Strictly Come Dancing and going on a turbo trainer with chocolate. So I was really unprepared. I, I signed up in November. I left in January and partly it was to, try and get away from what I've been going through and especially this feeling of guilt at having to, you know, put staff into redundancy, which I found very difficult and the feeling of anger that the government was making us, was, was cutting us. And then it set up three different organizations in our place. And that kind of like <laughs> that childlike feeling of it's not fair. Well, life isn't fair. And it, you know, and so off I went. And really that was, that was a turning point. Um, because I think, I remember when I signed up for it, my mom was really upset and she said, what are you doing? You'll never get another job again. And actually she was kind of right, but not for the reasons that she thought, but the reason was that after spending, you know, from January till May in the total freedom of riding a bike across Africa and putting yourself through that as well, the physical duress of it, the 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 kind of the mental strength you needed to just get on the bike in the morning when you oh my goodness I didn't want to so many days I didn't want to um and then getting to the end the camaraderie of the group the the dangers we encountered because we did all of those things and the just the sheer enormous fantastic pleasure of it 
you know, the thought of going back to being a chief executive after that was, it, it was impossible. And also I think I'd become probably more or less unemployable. Yeah, it's, it's that sort of uh, taking the risk to do it. And I suppose, what was that trip like? Because I know you came out with the book, uh, Dodging Elephants. You are very good at doing your research. Yes, Dodging Elephants. So that will give you a clue as to some of the things that happened <laughs> during the trip. There was wildlife. That trip was amazing. It's the Tour de Freak, and that's A-F-R-I-Q-U-E as opposed to F-R-E-A-K. Um, it's an annual race, three times longer than the Tour de France. You do a stage, there's 100 days racing, 20 days rest. Um, you, some of it you do in a peloton just in order to keep your times up. And because you're on uh, tarmac, other parts of it, there's no, you know, you're way off road. Um, you're just it, on your own in the African countryside, the African bush, which is one of my favorite days. And you, you go through 10 countries, you go through a whole continent, you go through the seasons, you go through, you know, we were at 50 degrees heat in the Sudan. And then we went into the rainy season in Tanzania where you had to stop your bike, find a puddle. That was easy. Wash you know, declog the derailleur and your pedals and then get back on the bike and then do the same again in an hour because the mud was just so thick. Um, and we, we kind of cycled into not cold, cold beginning of winter in South Africa. So that whole across the planet kind of feeling of, of a journey and of a length and of actually spending time in the world was very addictive. Yeah, I'm sure. And so what were the sort of amazing moments from that other than picking up your bike and putting in a puddle and <laughs> washing washing the Tanzanian mud off? <laughs> I think there was, a, the, the, there was um, I'm kind of, the dodging elephants was a very big moment because that was very dangerous. But I think one of the big days for me was we hit, we hit a place called the Lava Road and it's in northern Kenya. And when we cycled through northern Kenya, it was the biggest drought that's been for 25 years. And it, the temperature was in, I'd say, the mid-30s, and the lava road was exactly what it said. It was a road across a lava field. So if you can imagine cycling over sharp black rocks, um, I think I saw one tree on that whole expanse. And sitting by the side of the road were people begging for water because there was no water. Now, if you can imagine a human being having to sit beside a road and beg for the, the, the thing you need after air to actually survive, that, f that really affected me and made me understand, you know, the, in, the unbelievable privilege of my own life and of all of us who live where you can drink water without sitting there by the side of a road in the hope that a, a lorry will come past. And the second thing was I couldn't give them water because I had my camel back and I needed it and I knew that. So I actually denied a human being the thing they needed. So that's pretty shitty, actually. So that, that day always stuck with me. And the other thing that stuck with me is if you, again, the concept of anyone who's been on a, cycle, a bike, like there is some kind of momentum usually. You'll, you'll pedal, but at some point you're not pedaling every stroke. On the lava road, you're pedaling every single stroke because you're basically going over these black rocks. So you're, you're, arse is slamming into the saddle with every single pedal stroke and I managed to develop cystitis halfway through that day which was very unpleasant because I felt like I needed to pee I didn't need to pee it's the in the 30s I have to get to the end of the road and that day was the only day I very rarely cry at things extremely apart from the Olympics when people win gold and I'm very happy for them I very very rarely cry but I remember on that day the sun was almost setting. I was the last person on the road. Um, everyone else had either given up, got in the truck. Most people gave up. Two thirds of people that day gave up. Um, I was the last one on the road. The person in front of me, Sam, I'd, I'd seen him. He was about 20 minutes ahead of me and he was still cycling and I was still on the road. And, you know, my nether regions were on fire. I was just, everything was caked in sweat. My legs were giving up. They were just trembling, trembling, trembling from going everything. And I was just thinking, this is never, ever going to end. This is literally, uh, this is like some kind of Sisyphean nightmare. I'm never going to get there. And seeing Sam disappear into the distance, thinking he's still 20 minutes ahead. And these tears just trickled down my face. I remember thinking, what are you doing? You don't have enough water. Stop crying immediately. So I did. But that was the kind, that was the day that forged me a little bit. I think um, through 
uh, discomfort like that, you grow quite a lot very quickly, especially in situations like that. Um, by putting yourself in such a vulnerable and uncomfortable position, um, you know, it, it's sort of, it's sort of, oh, what's the word? It, it sort of shows you who you really are. It sort of breaks you down to the bare bones. And that's when you sort of come through and you're like, oh, wow, actually, I am made of so much more than I ever gave myself any credit for. Yeah, I think that's true. But do you also find it's like now I just think, how did I do that? Looking back at it, I'm like, I don't, you know, and you, for me, it's always the first time. I always think I, I could, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I could do it again. You know, am I going to be able to face the next challenge? I think there's never any certainty, even when you do overcome things, at least for me. But I suppose a lot has to do with your mindset that you or your frame of mind when you went into that race, you know, if your mindset was no matter what, I am going to complete this journey rather than, oh, someone said this might be fun. Let's see what it's like. Two very different mindsets to where someone who might come into a lot of trouble and pain might say, well, this is just awful. I need to quit. Whereas if your mindset's like, no matter what gets thrown at me, I'm just going to embrace it and carry on and take it a step further and try and overcome it. And I think your mindset in those situations are incredibly important. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think for me, after I'd finished Tour de Freak, the I signed up for the Marathon de Sable, having got a bit addicted to adventures, which is the six marathons across the desert in six days. Um, and used to be called the toughest race on earth. I don't think it is, but it's quite hard. Um, and on that one, I was like, uh, you know, they will literally have to carry me off in my coffin before I stop doing this. I am going to finish this race because I'm an absolutely terrible runner. Um, and I was determined to finish it. So for that one, I didn't even let the possibility of failure enter my head. And I think it's quite important not to let that idea that you might, if I ever think, oh, I can stop. If I literally, if I think, oh, I can stop, then I will stop. Even if I'm not tired, if I, you know, if I'm walking up the hill to my house, which I have to do with all my groceries, which is not nothing here because I live up a mule track on the side of a mountain. Um, if I think, oh, I'll just stop half, I, I can stop halfway for rest. I immediately stop, even though I'm not halfway and put my bags down. So mindset is all. Yeah, God. And, you know, the Marathon de Sable does throw up a few sort of curveballs and everything. Were you running quite a lot through it or was it more, because I know a lot of people, most, a lot of people like to walk it because it's sort of, they can preserve energy better or a lot of people run it because they're like, I want to get the hell out of here. I think, um, I, well, I, there were 1,100 people who did it in my year and I came 665th. I just missed the side of the beast. So, which was brilliant for me. I was kind of midfield. I was ecstatic. Um, I ran and walked and I would strongly advise anyone going into an ultra to go into the mindset that you're going to run as much of it as you can. Uh, because yes, you could walk, I guess, the whole of MDS and finish in the time limits, but it would take a huge toll on your body and your feet. And also running, you know, if you r running, you have a different footfall from walking. Everyone walks a little bit in the MDS, even the elites, because you're going up a whacking great big sand dunes. So everybody has to walk a little, but it's all a matter of degree. So I would say I... Well, I don't know if I had to really calculate it. I'd say I probably ran 40%, walked 60% or maybe 50-50. But that kind of, that kind of balance. Um, the last day, the last marathon day when my feet were absolutely destroyed, as in walking up to the start, I thought, I know I'm going to do it because I'm on my last day, but I don't know how I'm going to bear the pain. I genuinely don't. I was on my sticks and I was, you know, I could have been 387 years old. Um, and my friend Charlie, I was running with, was like, well, how many painkillers have you got? And I got, oh, I've got, I've got 20 left. He was like, take six now, take th two of each kind you've got, and then take two different ones every hour. So I started off the last stage high as a kite, um, 
tripping on ibuprofen, cocodamol and um, paracetamol. And actually, and I thought, oh my God, my feet hurt so much. I might as well just run this, I won't say the word, this bad race because everything hurts so much. What, what can go wrong? And I started running and I, I ran almost that whole marathon with only like a couple of when, when the gradients got too steep, I, I walked it. But that was my best day, weirdly. And I think it was the realizing that running actually saved my feet because we just come out of the long stage where you do a lot of walking and it's my heels that were knackered. So running on my fore, forefoot was actually less painful. <laughs> That's a good That's tip. A good tip. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Take painkillers, use them. Don't be afraid. Sorry, yeah, doctors. My, Under a doctor's supervision, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same in my run uh, that I did in Kenya. I, by the end, I was taking sort of, you know, four, six painkillers. And when I finished, I couldn't walk. But then as soon as I had to run, I'd take the painkillers and then I'd run. It was a really sort of strange because anytime someone saw me, Towards the end, they'll be like, you know, how is this even possible? He can't even get up off the seat. He can't even walk. He has to sort of get help. And then as soon as take a few painkillers, right, run. And then, you know, you'd run a marathon and you sort of get to the end and you'd be like, right, um, dead wear off. You'd collapse in a heap. And then next day, take them, go again. <laughs> That's very intense what you did, though. I mean, that bravo, I take my chapeau off to you. Uh, well, and so you're in Morocco now and you, during lockdown, managed to go on quite a sort of epic trip in the lockdown. I did. Well, so what happened was I, um, I kind of wanted to morph a little bit from doing adventure adventures into doing more exploring and trying to use my languages. I speak Arabic and I've been learning Tashlahit, which is one of the Amazir Berber languages here. And I, I thought I want to do something in Morocco. You know, I'm in Morocco. I love it. I, I came here to train for the Marathon des Sables, by the way, and liked it so much that I stayed. So be careful um, if you do things like that. You don't know where it's going to lead you. And I would started this expedition in 2019. I walked the length of the Dra River, which is the longest river in Morocco. And I was the first woman. Well, these firsts are always a bit dodgy, but as far as I know, I was the first woman to do it. And then it morphed into thinking, well, I'll do the whole of Morocco. I'll join it up with a desert leg and a northern leg. And then I'll have done the whole thing um, with a kind of a weird crisscross in the middle. So I'd done the draw leg. I'd done the Sahara leg, which was insanely difficult. And then the last leg was the Atlas leg, which was from Nador to Warzazat, Nador on the Mediterranean coast, down the, down the reef mountains, the Atlas mountains, and down into Warzazat, where I'd started the whole thing with the draw. And we scheduled to do it in June of 2020. And then, of course, Corona hit. And in Morocco, it was very strict. I was here in my little house in the Atlas Mountains. We weren't allowed to leave our houses um, at all for 14 weeks, except to go shopping. And we had to have a paper from the government saying that one person per household was allowed to go out. So it was incredibly strict. And as a foreigner, as a guest in someone else's country, um, I stuck to the rules like 99.9% .9 because I am the only Westerner in this village. I am a woman. I am, as I say, I strongly feel that I'm in somebody else's country and that I have to abide by their rules. I like 100%. Um, and also, I didn't know what would happen. You know, Mor Morocco was infected by covid from Europe. So I wasn't 100% sure how people were going to feel about that. So I stayed indoors and in 14 weeks, the most I walked was a kilometer. Um, and that, I just found that insanely difficult. I really locked, I was not, you know, I was not one of those who was breaking sour bread and doing yoga and learning to play the violin. I just basically sat and moaned quite a lot. And tried to keep I did quite a few articles and talks but I I certainly didn't thrive during lockdown and then we came out of strict lockdown we were allowed to move within the country a little bit and we managed Jean-Pierre my expedition organizer from Dardaif he managed to get the permissions from all the local authorities except for the last one and we set off on the, on our expedition across the Atlas Mountains and we set off in August the end of August 
it was so unbelievably hot. It's the hottest time of year. It was so hot that on the first day, the camels who were undernourished because one of the bad things about corona in Morocco is that the, and we've had a double whammy. We've had corona and we've had an ongoing drought. So the animals usually graze wild in the desert, in the case of the camels in the Sahara in the south. Um, but their diet is supplemented by food bought by their work in the tourism industry. No work, no supplementary food. No, none of the farmers can afford to feed their animals extra food. They, you know, people are hanging on. So this was the, the, the animals were, they were fine, but they were not in, in the fantastic shape that I was used to. And on the first day, they all sat down. They just sat down in the mountains. They couched, you know, camels couch on their forelegs and then their hind legs and tuck them all underneath. And they just couched. And when I said to Brahim, I was like, Brahim, who's our expedition leader, who was with me for seven and a half months for the whole trip. I was like, Brahim, what? Is going on. Why is Hamish my favorite camel? Why? Why are they all? Why are they couching? And he went, "It's too hot." I said, "What do you mean? It's too hot. I'm Scottish. It's too hot for me." My face was beetroot, and I was just sweating like a shower. I was like, "It's too hot for me." They're camels. He went, "It's too hot." It's too hot for them to be carrying loads up hills in this weather. So we started off very, very gently because the camels were our most important. They're the most important part of this expedition because they're carrying our food and water and our, our equipment. And also, you know, we like our camels. So we had to go very, very slowly at the start for the camels, not for the fair Scottish person. God, wow. And what was the sort of, because uh, how long was that trip for? It was, it was just over two months. Um, we made good time and it was very fascinating for me the quest I mean it was the part three of my Moroccan journey so it was bringing bringing that trilogy to an end it was through the Atlas Mountains which are just de facto stunningly beautiful and varied we we had plenty of water well not entirely the whole way but most of the way we had plenty of water whereas um the Sahara expedition water had been absolutely in crisis so I was really looking forward to it and also it was the men's the men are Berber all Amazirs so we were going at the end we would be near their home so they knew the route and they were like really into it they're like we're going to show you this and we're going to show you this and wait till you see this and you know so I I was excited about all of that I was also on the hunt for dinosaur footprints because the final part of the expedition goes through an area where there are dinosaur traces. So it was a very exciting thought, being in freedom again, this idea of, you know, lockdown would be like boarding school and an expedition is like back to the running around in the, in the countryside. So the, the sheer freedom of walking was just amazing. Um, and then what I hadn't thought about particularly, and again, it, it struck me as I was doing it, was walking through this incredible point of history because I just walked through Corona. You know, I got to see how the virus is affecting the most remote, some of the most remote communities on earth. And you would think it wouldn't affect them at all. You know, a nomadic community that lives off its animals, how are they going to be affected by Corona? They're not going to get it. We didn't meet a single person, by the way, in 1500 kilometers who had Corona or, or even who knew someone who had it. There wasn't any. And we took our precautions and we took our lead just to assure people that we were safe. We, we took very good precautions and we also took our lead from the people we met on the way. If they kept their distance, we, we always put our masks on. We always kept our distance. But then if they came and welcomed us and embraced us, we, by, you know, after the first 10 days, we knew we didn't have it. We were in our own little bubble. Um, and we'd had tests anyway. So, we just went by their lead and some people welcomed us. A few people were frightened of us, but most people were delighted to see somebody doing something active and something kind of historic in Corona. Because for Moroccans, what's fascinating for me and, and actually rather delights my soul is that I'm, I'm going through taking notes on traditional ac architect, um, architecture, clay built houses, on what the women are wearing, the traditional clothing, on how they're farming, you know, what people are eating. And I'm like, oh, it's very interesting. Ooh. And then, of course, they're looking at our camel caravan and they're saying to us, you're like something from A Thousand and One Nights. You're like something from a fairy tale and taking videos with us and selfies with the camels because nobody travels in a camel caravan anymore. So 
Whereas I'm busily looking at the traditions I'm passing through, they're looking at me and the camels and the, our, and the men and going, oh my goodness me, you're from the medieval past. God, what a, what a sight. How amazing. Uh, it must have been just such an incredible experience sort of going through there, especially after probably the sort of winter lockdown that we all, all had. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, winter lockdown is just grim. And yes, I do think I love that there's some beautiful, you, especially in the, I mean, all through Morocco. Morocco is, is extremely rich in landscape. You have a huge variety of landscapes in one country. Um, but in this Atlas trip, we started in the reef mountains, which are these conifer forests, uh, mountains, um, but not as steep as the Atlas. We went through those. It was very, very hot, dusty. And then we went on to the Rakam Plateau, which is a hundred kilometer long, very high, it's a thousand meters high plateau of just dead, you know, sand, dead flat, um, some scrub, wild, you know, some wild herbs, some grazing for the flocks. And it's inhabited by a very specific um, tribe, I think is the correct word, of nomads who can trace their descendants back to Yemen and the Arab Peninsula. They're called Beni Halal, the, the sons of the crescent moon, because they came over in the Arab conquest extremely hospitable people. We had the most beautiful experiences there. They live in goat's hair tents woven from their flocks by the women. And they usually have a one concrete room built with a huge solar panel on the top, which um, powers up their mobile phones um, and their fridge. Everybody has one fridge or a freezer that they can keep things in. And then the women tend to do all the cooking and caring for the animals, caring for their children in the tent which is much cooler and more comfortable. And then the, the concrete room is like a salon. So when we were invited for a feast, I'd be with the women in the tent because we always split off. So I'd be with the women and the men would be in the salon. And then I'd usually be asked to join as a kind of honorary man later on. So that was another thing that would, has been fascinating for me is because as a woman, um, I don't want to like go on about gender differences, but actually the one thing I can, my superpower is that I can talk to women in traditional communities, which men can't. And I'm sure you've found this in your travels. You know, I literally get separated from the men. And that's actually a privilege because it means I get both sides of the story and I get to hear what, what, what's troubling the, what the women are thinking about during Corona as well as the men. The men are thinking about how are they going to feed the family? Can they get any money for their sheep? Because the bottom completely dropped out of the meat market. Um, how are they going to, you know, if they don't have enough grazing, how are they going to afford a bag of oats? The women are not talking about that. The women are talking about their children, their health. The women are talking about they're worried about their daughters not going to school because it's such a, a it's relatively, relatively new that um, universal education and women want their daughters to be educated. So a lot of the things I heard were, you know, we're really worried. Our, our children are missing out. Our, our girls are missing out on their education. We want them to have a different life from us. So that was fascinating for me. And, and I felt it as like a, an additional gift that I was able to mix with both sides of the gender divide. God, wow. And uh, so after two, two months there, you sort of finished it. Where, whereabouts was it? Where did it finish? We finished, so the, the point, because we were doing this whole, all the way through Morocco, but we'd started in the middle. So my, my three-part Morocco journey was, I did the middle first, I did the last bit second, if you were doing north to south, and I did the first bit last. And the reason for that was partly that it had grown out of the dry expedition. I had such a fantastic experience on the dry expedition, and it was so fascinating and rich that I thought, yeah, I'm just continuing. And then it was weather-related, you know, the Sahara you can only do in adventuring season really between October and March. And the Atlas, we, we spent our whole time in the Atlas starting in that burning heat. And then by the end, we had snow on the mountains and we were so worried the last two weeks, I'd say, we were, we were trying to keep ahead of the snowfall because if the snow had fallen heavily, which it can at that time of year, we'd have been trapped or if there'd been a very big um, flood, you know, uh, rain, rainfall and snow melt, we, we'd have been trapped. So <laughs> again, I think a fascinating thing about long expeditions is, is weather becomes your so important. It's not just that like, oh, nice weather we're having today. It's like, 
is snow coming? Is snow coming? Is, have you heard any snow and things like that? So you're always, you know, thinking ahead to the next, the next type of weather you're going to encounter. Wow. And so those sort of communities, how are they sort of holding up now? Well, it's, we've just had Eid al-Adha, which is the big uh, holiday in, in uh, the Muslim, Islamic world, which marks the, the Feast of the Sacrifice, um, when God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son, and then at the last minute substituted uh, a goat or a sheep. Um, and it's a big deal here, as it is everywhere in the Muslim world. It is really... It's a very religious moment. Everybody prays, everybody goes to the mosque and everybody remembers and is grateful for the things that we have. Um, but it's also family time, so we all come together. So this year, last year, the government uh, was supplying the people with extra food because it's a feast, you know, it's like Christmas. People want to have extra food for their families. And this year they weren't. So it was tighter for people in this rural community. And really every family wants to have a sheep or a goat. It's it very much the tradition, the father of the house slaughters it. it. It's part of the whole ritual of Thanksgiving, effectively, and also to have the meat because people here don't eat very much meat. I think they probably eat in a week what a Western person would eat in one meal, actually, possibly two meals. Um, and so things were harder here. So the communities always works together and people have a bit more give away and when you even when you have your sheep the you're meant to eat a third give away two thirds um i think in imlil for example where i live it's it's very much a a trekking village we're right at the heart of the atlas mountains we're on the gateway to north africa's highest mountain mount tubkal i don't know if you've climbed it yet Always welcome. So it has the feeling of one of those Nepalese trekking villages. So here there's like loads of mules, loads of, um, for baggage. There are loads and loads of guides and there's lots of very small jeet and nicer hotels. It, 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 it's geared up for that backpacking industry. And of course, there hasn't been any for, blimey, a year and a half. Um, so what, but it's also agricultural. So where I live, I live above the walnut trees. So my terrace is, it, is, because I'm built on a mountain, um, the walnut tree tips come over the top of my terrace, which is really pretty. So I look out into a sea of green, very rich agriculturally here. It's very rich ground. So everybody has a small farm. The cow, for the, I live in a family compound, the cow lives under my bedroom and the chickens just live at that window down below. So you might hear them. Um, so everybody's reasonably self-sufficient. So I don't think this area suffered as much as some of the cities did where they can't fall back on, you know, tending their gardens, doing the farming a bit harder, at least getting your staple vegetables, your potatoes, carrots, onions, getting milk from the cow. You might have a couple of sheep or goats that, you know, you can use through the year. You've got chickens, you can get the eggs. So I think here people were slightly better off. But what nobody's been able to do is what, what I constantly hear is, is progress, plan for the future, um, take any risks. People have been building because again, they just do it with local, local, um, materials. You know, you get the stones out of the river valley, you get the mud a bit further up the river valley, uh, or you might buy some cement. And then because nobody's working, a lot of people are guides or hotel, or jeet, auberge owners here, inn owners. Uh, all the men get together and build things. So we've seen a lot of building, but people haven't been able to progress with their lives. And I think that's been a huge frustration as it has for everybody. But there's no, in a community like this, you wouldn't have a family going hungry because everybody else would team together to give them food. God, uh, yeah, it's, it's always, um, it always comes back to sort of knock, knock those sort of groups out really. And those are always the ones that struggle. Um, but no, it's it's incredible, and I have to say, I'm, I'm slightly jealous of where you are at the moment. It looks just like the most incredible place. Alice was very kind to sort of show me her view just before the podcast started. We would have done it outside, but it's too windy. You have to sit in. It, it's so hot here at the moment that during the day you tend to sit inside between kind of ten and five with the window shut, which sounds awful. And then you you try and do your outside bits in the morning or in the evening although last week I did go on a 13 hour hike 
which, oh, wow. yeah, it was that long because I'm so unfit and I'm so fat at the moment. Um, so it's self-inflicted, those magnums during lockdown. But my God, it really took it out of me I, by the end of it, because the sun is, is very, you know, it's, it's pretty hot and we're at high altitude. Started off at 1,750 meters and the first climb was 1,200 meters straight up. Oh, man, by the time I got to the top, I was huffing and puffing like a demon, but it was great. And again, it was one of those things I kind of woke up in the morning and I thought, oh man, I don't want to do this. But I booked, I, I booked a guide. One of the things I like to do is work with the local guides because they are amazing. I get so much information. I have so much fun. And also, frankly, you know, walking up a mountain you don't know on your own is stupid. Um, so... I didn't want to let my guide down. I thought, right, I got everything ready the night before, so I had no excuses, went up. And then, of course, as you're doing it, your part of you just enjoys it so much. Um, you know, meeting shepherds on the top of the peak who made us a cup of tea, a cup of hot, sweet tea, and then finding out when he looked up, this shepherd had made us tea in a little teapot, uh, boiled on some scrub, some uh, little bushes. And he'd been tending the tea, so his face was down the whole time. And then when he looked up, we worked out that he was the shepherd I'd met on the very first day after the first lockdown, when we were, sorry, my earpiece has come out, when we were allowed out, I went on a walk up my local pass and he was at the top of the pass and really incredibly unusually in Morocco and, and not in, a, in any way, a kind of aggressive way. He gave me a kiss on the cheek because he was so relieved to be out of lockdown and I was so relieved to be out of lockdown and we'd shared a cup of tea then as well. And imagine meeting him on that 13 hour hike the other day. It was just so nice. Oh, wow. I mean, you have some incredible stories of Morocco and, you know, some of the stuff you've done over the years is truly incredible. And I imagine you've got quite a few more planned for the future ahead. <laughs> I have. Um, it's quite interesting at this time of Corona. I don't know how everyone else is managing. I, ha I have got an expedition I want to do. It's not actually in Morocco. And I don't want to be too explicit about it at the moment because it feels very far away from being realized. So the way I'm trying to think of my, you know, my, my, my work at the moment is I'm going to continue to explore in the country while flights and traveling are so complicated you know, literally you can leave a country and then the next day you're not allowed back into it, which has happened to me. So I think, I think one has to be a bit, you, you just have to weigh up what you're going to do. There's still loads of things to do in Morocco. There's an area in the north where there's a big national park where they've got eagles that I haven't explored yet. So I'm thinking of going up there. I might get back on my bike and cycle to Essaouira, um, which will kill me because I haven't been on my bike for so long. But I think sometimes just do stuff and worry about it after. And then I'm planning this big expedition, which will be outside of Morocco. And I'm hoping to get some traction on that and to start recceing for it um, in the autumn and doing it probably in a year's time um, next autumn, which, which feels very long away. But these big expeditions where you're trying to explore a little bit and break a little bit of new ground they they do take a, adventures are one thing because adventures in a way especially if you do an organized one which are absolutely fantastic and which i love and which i would jump at doing in between um are one thing but if you're organizing yourself you know having to get buy camels or hire camels or find a route find guides navigate the governments of the different countries because I think, I don't know if people understand this, but for example, in Morocco, if you want to go off the beaten track in the way that I was, you need government position, permission. We had to send our coordinates every single night to the gendarmerie, the police force and the military when we were in military zones. There's, there's none of that hidden secret, you know, going under the radar. There is no under the radar here. And I think that's true for an awful lot of the countries that I am particularly interested in traveling in. And also there's no, I mean, I'm trying to publicize what I do. So I'm not trying to be under the radar in, fa in fairness. Um, but I think people might be surprised at how much time and effort you need to get the governments on side because it's national government, but it's also local government and regional government usually. And then you might also have to get the army on side. Yeah, I, plan, planning expeditions do does take an enormous amount. It's actually 
probably the, the hardest part of the expedition is getting it off the ground. I mean, once you start, you know everything about it. So that's the main bit. But getting everything sorted, fundraising, the equipment, it's all great fun. But yeah, it, it, it takes a lot of work. And do you find it, I mean, I'm, I find it daunting. I, I, I really find, I find it daunting. I'm like, how am I going to do this? I, the countries I'm going to, I don't know anyone there. I don't know a single person. How am I even going to start this? You know, far less get a meeting with the Minister of the Interior. I mean, it really, it is genuinely quite kind of, uh, it can be quite paralyzing. I think you just have to start. Well, Alice, there's a part of the um, podcast where we ask the same five questions to each guest each week. <laughs> with the first one being, what gadget do you always take on your expeditions? I always take an Esbit stove and um, titanium mug with a lid, which is a pot, so that I can make a, and some... Uh, some you know little compressed fuel so that I am can make myself a cup of tea in my tent if it's gale force winds and I can't get over to the mess tent or cook outside. Uh, what is your favorite adventure or travel book? I like everything written by Freya Stark. She is a heroine of mine and she wrote one about the assassins which is about traveling through the, um, the valleys in where the original Assassin, the, the word comes from there, and they they were um, a group of blokes who basically were high on hashish all the time, hence the name, and were guns for hire. So I love Freya Stark. Very nice. Why are adventures important to you? I think they make me feel fully alive, and they give a structure to my life, and they increase learning, and they allow me to communicate stories to other people and to bring a little bit of, sometimes a little bit of enjoyment and pleasure to other people, which I really enjoy. But yeah, they, they make me feel fully alive. That's the main reason. Oh, very nice. Uh, what about your favorite quote? I will never surrender, Winston Churchill. <laughs> was, it, uh, was there a bit more to it or just I will never surrender? No, I, th I think I've misquoted him horribly, but it, I, I didn't do any research. But that's it. I actually took, and I know he's not very fashionable at the moment, but I do think if you want to um, just think about resilience and keeping going when things look really, really, really dark, really impossible to win, I would have said that for many people, the thought of Britain and the Allies winning the war at some stages was impossible. Um, if you listen to some of Churchill's speeches, I actually took one of his speeches on the Marathon de Sable with me on my phone, just in case. But it, but it was about, you know, in the darkest of times, just we will never surrender. Yeah, I, I, I think on one of my trips, someone had put a little quote of Churchill, which was um, winning. I'm going to have to because I've completely forgotten it. But it was like winning is not permanent, failure is not fatal, it is the courage to continue that counts. That's a beautiful quote, you know, and there's another one by Maya Angelou, which I have on my website, which I also really, really love. And it's, a, it, I'm going to paraphrase it because I'm not very good at remembering. And it basically says, um, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to eradicate intolerance by traveling, but maybe by showing people that we're all basically the same, that we all laugh, we all cry, we all hurt, we're all hungry. We can at least become friends. And that's, that's kind of, another really kind of beautiful sentiment. So it says, I think adventuring and exploring are between those two things, aren't they? They are between having to have some resilience and determination, but also having that desire to, to be part of this human family, to be part of this beautiful, amazing planet and to share that with others and, and to try and promote, even within yourself, promote tolerance and understanding and patience and those things that you learn because I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm impatient. I've got Celtic temperament and you, you just have to try and overcome those personal obstacles as well for, for moving through. <laughs> uh, people listening are always keen to travel and go on these sort of grand adventures. What's the one thing you would recommend to people wanting to get started? Be realistic. And I don't mean curb your enthusiasm. I mean, literally think about how are you going to get the money to do it? 
or the opportunity to do it? Um, is it attainable? Is that is your dream maybe step two? How are you going to, what's, what's your exact aim with what you're doing? You know, is it because you want to do a TV program about it, write a book about it? Is it because you just want to do the adventure? Um, can you pay for it yourself? Do you need to get someone else to do it? Because that will change how you approach things. So I think mine, mine is very boring. I think look at the kind of practicalities of it, if you can. Uh, seek advice from others. There are so many great podcasts like the one we're on now where people can give you advice. Reach out. You know, I mean, I'm always willing to share advice um, and and just just ask around. And, and usually the community is very helpful, I would say, wouldn't you? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I try if people have a specific question that they want answering about travel or a place in Central Asia. I mean, I recently had someone who's out in Central Asia asking me about Tajikistan. And as you say, I, I don't know, I can't speak for others, but when someone's like, oh, you know, how is Tajikistan or somewhere, suddenly I'm in a a role of just reeling off the best places because it just brings back these incredible memories. And I think people love sharing those moments. So, yeah, it's definitely um, yeah something I, I always like to hear from people. Um, finally, what are you doing now and how can people follow you and find you in the future? Right now, I'm back living in the Atlas Mountains in my small Amazir community, Berber community. I am podcasting, blogging, trying to get fit again so that my next hike doesn't take 13 hours, planning for the next adventure. I've just written a book, so I have to do some revisions. So I'm in that kind of stage of things. Um, also, having been banned from Morocco for six months because of Corona. I got stuck in the UK. Um, I'm keen to do a bit, kind of continue exploring locally and seeing things I haven't seen. People can contact me best ways through my website because all my links are on there. It's alicemorrison.co.uk, but I am Alice out there one on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. I'm a new TikTok star, by the way. I've put up, I've put up my third video, got 95,000 views. Oh, check you I out. Know, I know, I know. It's so funny. I'm not obviously not a TikTok star, but I've just started putting up just little videos from the hikes and, you know, meeting a goat and also having tea with people. Those two are not parallel, but um, yeah. So everything's on my website, alicemorrison.co.uk, including the books, the podcast, Alice in Wonderland. I think that's enough self-promotion. <laughs> Well, it's been absolutely amazing listening to your stories and I cannot thank you enough for coming on the podcast today. My pleasure. It's so much fun to be allowed to talk about the adventures. <laughs> Usually, like, if you try and talk to friends and family, their eyes just glaze. <laughs> They're not interested. <laughs> and as I say, it's just, it's just great fun uh, listening and speaking about adventures. It's one of the best things about this. Can I only say one thing as well, is that, um, you know, I've, I've been lucky because I've built up to doing some really amazing stuff. And, but, but anyone can do this, literally. You know, if I can set off and cycle across Africa after training in front of Strictly Come Dancing on a turbo and not even doing that very well, it really is, if you want to do something, just, just really do go for it. It will be worth it. It doesn't matter where it takes you. And, and don't think you need to know all the answers before you start. I, I didn't know I was going to end up living in Morocco and walking the whole of Morocco with six camels, one called Hamish. Um, I came to run the Marathon des Sables and I stayed. Life is an adventure. It does lead you places. Just be open to where it leads you and it's always worth it. And don't worry about what other people think at all because it doesn't matter. Truthfully, it really doesn't. Unless they're going to put you in prison, then it does. Well, there you go. What are you waiting for? <laughs> <laughs> Alice, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, that is it for today. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you got something out of it. If you did, hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you in the next video.